paid about $700 for obesity-related illnesses through Medicare and Medicaid. So that's if you paid taxes, $700 of your taxes, um, really more because the government is, of course, running a gigantic deficit. But you're paying about $700 a year to, to treat this. We're speaking with Rolf Winkler of the Wall Street Journal. Are there actually companies, though, that are banning sweet treats? I don't know. I think there's a lot of bosses somewhere who say, guys, please, please, just less of them. <laughs> don't put them here. Uh, we, found some, we found a guy in, in L.A. who, uh, it, was a little, it was funny, he, he had said, you know what, after the holidays, I think we, we've overdone the treat. Can we just can we stop bringing them in? Can we stop doing the rundown to the bakery every day to get, to get the, to the treat? And uh, he says that actually ended. He thinks he broke it. He thinks he's the one who actually broke the sugar embargo inside his office. <laughs> are there people that are trying to bring in better stuff, fruits or nuts or something, and is that going over well? Oh, all the time. I think lots of people. I know in my office I try to sometimes, but and I, I tell you, in my experience, they, you know, at the Wall Street Journal we like to celebrate when you get a story on page one. So typically the easy thing to do is buy a box of donuts because donuts are cheap. And, oh, you know, woe to the person who said, you know what, I'm going to bring in carrots and hummus or i'm going to bring in uh <laughs> bananas um that's just there's going to be hell to pay <laughs> hummus and bananas this weekend's jennifer koshenka with wall street journal reporter rolf winkler 30 minutes now after the hour on this weekend look into any great business whether it's a manufacturer or a hotel a store school or hospital look into each and every one of them and you'll find the same thing great people at Kronos, we believe that great businesses are powered by great people. And with Kronos Workforce Solutions, we'll help you find them, keep them, and engage them. Learn more at Kronos.com. Kronos, workforce innovation that works. When a state ranks among the top 10 in the country for major new and expanded facilities, that's pure growth. When it's tops for four straight years, that's pure Michigan. Long known as a world leader in the automotive industry, Michigan is also a leader in advanced manufacturing, cybersecurity, agribusiness, and aerospace. In fact, CNBC rates Michigan as the most improved state for business. To learn more, visit michiganbusiness.org. Behind the headlines, above the noise, you're listening to America's First News this weekend with Gordon Deal. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. Gordon Deal with Jennifer Koshenka coming up this half hour. Financial questions to ask yourself. Also, the most notorious towing company in Chicago. And what South Carolina churches are offering certain communion recipients. We'll have that story in about 20 minutes. The player payroll of an NFL team is about $175 million, but many teams pay the place kicker on the roster roughly the league minimum salary, which is often less than a million bucks a year. So what, you say, right? To most fans, seems like an easy job. Try telling that to the Minnesota Vikings or the Cleveland Browns, whose kickers at the time missed a combined seven field goals and extra points last Sunday. More from New York Times sports writer Bill Pennington. Bill, how do you see it? Yes, not all kickers are paid the same. Uh, I think that I don't write headlines on my stories, but I think the headline that was written is pretty apt. And that's, and that said that when it comes to kickers, you get what you pay for. Um, a lot of NFL teams really don't feel like they need to invest a lot of money in their kickers, even though they're, they're the leading scorers on virtually every single team. I think they kind of think, well, one kicker is the same as another, but that, that's really not the truth. And if we didn't know that, we sure as heck know it now after watching those two games. Yeah. Boy, I mean, these are September games. It's not like uh, howling winds or driving snow sometime in November, December. Absolutely. No, the conditions were perfect. Uh, it's just a matter of, I, you know, I really think, and I've thought for a long time, that the NFL teams uh, should, you know, give a little more attention to who they're signing as their place kickers. I mean, they make, in essence, one 175th of the uh, salary in most of those teams. And they spend more money and more time on a fifth linebacker than they do in the kicker. And the fifth linebacker is barely on the field and certainly doesn't hold the outcome of a game in his, hand, in his hands as often as a kicker does. All right. We're speaking with Bill Pennington, sports writer at the New York Times. He's written a piece about Cleveland Browns kicker Zane Gonzalez and the Vikings kicker Daniel Carlson, who had dreadful weekends. Um, and there is, as you point out, Dan Bailey, the former Cowboys kicker, twiddling his thumbs on a couch somewhere over the weekend not working you suspect that will change 
I do. Uh, I suspect he'll be in Minnesota pretty soon because they are a contender, and they probably are going to say, well, we can't keep putting up with this. I mean, you know, the, not, you know, Carlson and, and Gonzalez aren't necessarily awful kickers. It's just sort of like a rookie in a baseball game. You really don't want – do you want them up with the bases loaded in the World Series, which is about how much pressure a lot of these NFL games come down to. Um, but, you know, maybe they need to ease into it. So I do think Bailey will get a job in one of those two places. Minnesota would be the better – opportunity and they they may they'll probably have to pay a couple million or three million dollars to get him i mean the nfl is big business that's you know that's that's a that's a good investment three two or three million dollars for one or two wins absolutely thanks bill it's new york times sports writer bill pennington since his story was written by the way dan bailey has in fact joined the vikings it is 22 minutes now in front of the hour on this weekend, you're unlikely to get the right answers unless you ask the right questions. That's especially true when it comes to managing money. We have answers thrust in our faces all the time, right? As marketers and salespeople try to get us to buy this mutual fund, that car, this stock, that home, certain insurance policy. But are these really what we want or need? That's the issue taken up by personal finance expert Jonathan Clements in his new book called From Here to Financial Happiness. He's also editor and founder of the website HumbleDollar.com. Jonathan, what questions? From Here to Financial Happiness aims to take people on a 77-day journey that helps them to figure out where they stand, what they want to get from their financial life, and what steps they need to take in order to get there. And really, the, the first two steps are really important. You know, Where do you stand? What do you want from your financial life? The latter in particular is very hard for people to figure out. I mean, we know tons of people end up with financial products they really shouldn't own. We know that tons of people pursue goals that really don't make them very happy at all. I mean, statistics prove it out. Over the last four decades, the standard of living in the U.S. has more than doubled, and yet our reported level of happiness has not risen. Money has not bought happiness. It should have, Mm. but it hasn't. So one of my goals with the book is to help people figure out what it is they really want from their money so that they can then pursue the goals they really care about. Wow. All right. So what are these questions then we should be asking ourselves? So one of the questions I ask early on in the book, actually on day two, is if money were no object, what would you change about your life? Would you retire? Would you swap careers? Would you move somewhere else? You know, would you take foreign trips? What is it that you would change about your life if money was not an issue? And while, you know, as I say in the book, I can't promise to make all of these dreams come true, yeah. unless you know where you want to go, you're never going to get there. Okay. And yeah. we all know that we buy tons of stuff that doesn't make us happy. This is the reason people have basements. Basements <laughs> are basically uncurated museums <laughs> devoted to the purchases we made and now regret. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, One of the things you tackle, too, is how much financial help should you give a child? Yeah, that's a really interesting one because it goes towards our financial attitudes. I mean, many of us grow up rebelling against our parents, and then we end up doing exactly what they do. So I would bet good money that how you think about the help you provide to your children is somehow influenced by what your parents did. Either you're replicating what they're doing or you're rebelling against it. But I think that this is a really important question. It goes to your values, and it also goes to what you want to teach your kids about money. So, for instance, you know, a lot of people have heated debates about should you pay kids to do chores or not, or should chores be part of, you know, being a member of the family. You know, get the kids get older, and it's like, should you pay for all their college costs, or should you make them work their way through college? You know, should they take out student loans? These are really big questions, and they influence not only your finances, but also the way that your kids will think about money. Hmm. We're speaking with Jonathan Clements. He's the founder and editor of HumbleDollar.com, and he's also written a new book called From Here to Financial Happiness, in which he examines questions we should be asking ourselves to figure out our financial lives. On a more serious note, too, uh, question number 15, who depends on you financially and how would they cope if you suffered ultimate, uh, an untimely demise? Explain that a little bit. So if you're single, you know, if you drop dead tomorrow, you know, people might be very sad, but nobody's, nobody's going to suffer any financial consequences. Okay. Nobody depends on you financially. But you know, if you've got a spouse and three kids, 
if you go under the bus tomorrow, you know, they may be left in the financial lurch and probably, you know, if you don't have a substantial amount of savings, what you need is some low cost term insurance to make sure that your family is able to make that transition after your death so you might have enough life insurance to pay off the mortgage and get your family through the next couple of years and maybe cover college costs. So you this is a really crucial question. You know, a lot of people focus on saving for the future. A lot of people focus on things like paying the bills and paying off the credit card debt. But having enough life insurance is probably, you know, the greatest gift that you can give to your to your family. Mm. But if you're going to do it, make sure you buy the right life insurance. So yeah. don't go and buy one of those extraordinarily expensive cash value life insurance policies. Instead, get a low cost term insurance policy. Thanks, Jonathan. Jonathan Clements, editor and founder of HumbleDollar.com. Again, his new book is called From Here to Financial Happiness. 14 minutes now in front of the hour on this weekend. Thanks for being with us. In a city known for gangsters, bootleggers, and corrupt politicians, residents will tell you the most reviled actor on the north side of Chicago is a tow truck company. Chicagoans for years have said Lincoln Towing Service, locally known as the Lincoln Park Pirates, has hauled away cars for no reason, overcharged motorists to get them back, and taunted owners who complained. Recently, a state commission revoked Lincoln's commercial vehicle relocator's license, and Chicago cheered. The story is by Wall Street Journal reporter Doug Belkin, who's in the Windy City. This, Doug, uh, sounds like no love loss here. So this tow company in Chicago has been infamous for a half a century for towing people who were parked legally, for not returning cars, for, for jacking up um, the tickets, and for sort of holding them as ransom, holding the cars as ransom, and for just being mean. They have a real reputation for being intimidating and mean. So they have this long history of antipathy between the city and, and this tow company, and after a long investigation and the petition and a lot of screaming and yelling, they were finally shut down. Boy, how come it took so long? So the, the biggest question is, uh, who are they paying off? That's what people are wondering in Chicago. Is, is there a, uh, you know, how, how do they maintain their, their business license as long as they did? And the answer is, I don't, I don't really know. Um, they, they've been in the spotlight for a long time. Um, there are a lot of cars in Chicago. There's a lot of uh, illegal parking. The attorney for the uh, tow company says, you know, that it's an infinitesimal number of, of cars that they have problems with, um, and a mountain has been made out of a molehill. Of course, the folks in Chicago do not agree with that. Well, I mean, it, it's, it seems from the stories within your piece that they knowingly took cars that were parked in legal spots and basically held them for ransom, knowing that people probably didn't have the time or energy to fight back or appeal or sue. It looks like the modus operandi was they would get a contract with a private lot. The contract would expire or wouldn't have, have not started yet, and the, uh, um, the tow truck company would still pull cars out of there, even though they didn't have... Um, uh, they didn't have a, a license to do it. Um, and then, yeah, there's just a tremendous amount of anger toward this company because when people would come to get the cars, um, they would just get yelled at and hollered at, and they couldn't, you know, they actually they passed a towing bill of rights because of this company so that uh, folks who had their cars to at least get into their cars and get their personal possessions out of them. Um, and they could see the charges in writing because there were problems on that score as well. Wow. Um but the uh, and there was a song uh, that was written in 1972, which is famous in Chicago, um, uh, called the Lincoln Park uh, Park Pirates, um, because they were sort of looking at their uh, shenanigans. We're speaking with Wall Street Journal reporter Doug Belkin. He's written a piece entitled "The Most Notorious Towing Company in Chicago, Maybe in America." Gets the boot. Give an example of uh, one of these folks you talked to and what they went through with this company. A lot of what. <laughs> What people talk about is getting screamed at by the tow truck drivers, getting um, coming in to pay the tickets, uh, complaining that they were towed illegally, that they shouldn't have been towed, and people telling them when they get there, um, in you know, in very vulgar and foul language, um, that's not their problem, and they had to pay two hundred fifty bucks to get the car back, and that was the end of that. Um, and then you know, in, in order to get uh, to appeal this. You'd have to you'd have to go to a, uh, a hearing, and you probably have, would have to go twice, and it's two hundred bucks, so it's you know it's not nothing, but it's uh, you want to take a day or two days off of work um, to make that happen. The answer is probably not. So um, I think what ultimately happened is social media caught up with them. People were able to connect with each other, um, you know, maybe five years ago, and start to sort of realize that this is happening to everybody, um, and 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 get together, and then one of the aldermen sort of took the bull by the horns and and started to drive the, the message a little bit. Nice, Doug. Wall Street Journal reporter Doug Belkin. He tells a story, by the way, of Abby Amy, 
who was six months pregnant in 20.